Good morning, Dr. Mendes. Morning. We are running these two series of uh, lectures, where is one of them is on infectious diseases, not particularly on malaria, and second is okay. the case series uh, of malaria. So generally, I receive lots of messages and, and you know queries and feedback after the talk. But this is the first time I have received multiple messages before your talk. So I can oh, really? see. Oh my god. Excited. Oh my God! I don't know. Uh, are we um, are we being joined by um, NIMR uh, field stations in the states? Yes, everywhere, everywhere. This this talk is open, and oh, uh, okay. NIMR entire uh, office here, all the field units, all the scientists, oh. all the PhDs, oh, postdocs, and oh, good. Uh, and we. Oh, I'm yes. excited! I'm very excited now, Dr. Sharma. That's nice. That's very uh, nice. We have sent this. Uh, to all the people who are a part of our lecture series in both the partners and mm -hmm. uh, to all the uh, universities, institutions and malaria researchers. So whatever we have the network. Okay. Oh, good. That's nice. I can hopefully hear from them and learn something from them. So <laughs> We also release uh, this uh, newsletter, which is monthly newsletter and okay. uh, mostly uh, the field of malaria, uh, where we highlight uh, anything significant in the particular month mm -hmm. and uh, some significant research studies we highlight. And uh, we also interview uh, you know, malaria researchers. So okay. this would be really, you know, very, very uh, helpful for us. And we will be really grateful if, if you please, uh, you know, agree for this interview. It's nothing like uh, only four, three, four short questions. Your journey, your suggestions, etc., related to malaria. So if this sure, would with pleasure, with pleasure, yeah. <laughs> I know you, the schedule is very busy, but no, it's okay. I'll, I'll be very happily uh, participate in a, in a discussion. Uh, only thing is, Dr. Sharma, I'm talking a little bit now. This is what Amit told me. I, I'm talking a little bit about uh, uh, my ex research experience in this lecture, so I hope it won't be duplicative. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Well, so we have started this program. You are very well aware about you. You know better than me. We have started this program in uh, 2020 somewhere, and uh, uh, till now we have uh, funded around 35 projects in different parts of India. We have identified seven sites, seven endemic sites. And with the same problem, we invited, uh, uh, we have given this invited presence to the, to the malaria researchers. So this is what we have done in the last year. And now the second call is open with a different uh, set of themes and research questions. And uh, we have received a good amount of application this, this year also. Okay. We have hopeful to give a few more good funding statements. It was uh, uh, initiated by uh, the DG ICMR in, uh, on the eve of malaria day in 2019. And mm -hmm. officially we have started in 2020 and we have uh, so far funded around uh, 35 projects in uh, various parts of the country with a similar set of questions. Right. And I see. Now the second call is uh, is open. We have received a good amount of applications uh, with a different set of themes and questions. So. So is this is this open for NIMR researchers in the country, or uh, this is, is it? No, no. This this Mere India call is for everyone, ICMR or non ICMR institution, private organization, NGOs, okay. everyone. Ah, so anyone. Oh, that's good. Okay, right. And Super. The main, yeah. So mainly we we uh, fund in the in the area of public health, operational, implementational sort of right. thing. Yeah. Are you uh, are you sort of leaning towards the malaria elimination effort? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Oh, that's good. So this is uh, this is just to support uh, the elimination target to support program here. Yeah. Yeah. I think. I mean, this is what I want to emphasize in. My talk as well. Uh, I think uh, 
NIMR has a major role to play in the in achieving elimination in India, and I I so hope uh, it will happen soon, at least in some states. So uh, anything that I can do to help, just just that ask. That is very much required, madam. Your guidance and supervision is is the utmost. I don't know about that. But I don't know how valuable, but I'm here to any time, as you know. I I'll be very pleased to be able to help. Good morning, Dr. Mendes. Uh, Hi, <laughs> Amit, I'm, how are you? Good to I'm see fine. you. <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. Uh, so yeah, good to see you. Yeah. It's, it's, well, we are, uh, we are very, we feel very privileged and, and honored that uh, you have agreed to uh, give this uh, lecture in our distinguished lecture series. So on behalf of, uh, of the erstwhile MRC and the new NIMR, uh, I wish to welcome you back home in a way. Uh, uh, you, uh, your journey with MRC and NIMR has been longer than anybody else's uh, that is present in this meeting probably. So um, it's just a wonderful, wonderful uh, and, and a great privilege for us to, to be able to host you uh, here. And thank you so much uh, for taking the time out to, 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 to end it, sort of enlighten us on, on malaria elimination from Sri Lanka, but also the general wisdom about um, what needs to be done in context of malaria for India. So um, I'll, I'll, pass, uh, I'll pass the baton on to Sachin who will, uh, who will uh, brief uh, the audience uh, uh, about <laughs> the luminary that you are, uh, most of us know, but uh, he will remind the young people, especially the PhD students and, and young faculty who, who at times are unaware of the history and I think they should be uh, they should be much more cognizant of what India and other countries have already been through, and what might be the future in context of malaria. So, thank you very much, and my deep, deep gratitude for 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 joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we will start, and before we start, uh, I good morning to everyone who are here and who will, who will join soon. Uh, this is, uh, I'm pretty excited and, and not me, the entire NIMR and the India team and entire ICMR family. We are really, really excited to uh, listen to Dr. Kamini Mendes here. Though I know that she is very well known, you know, uh, globally, she is known for the malaria elimination program. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, as a process, I will, I will read a few lines about her introduction. So uh, today we have uh, Professor Kamini Mendes. She is a world-renowned malariologist, medical scientist, and, uh, and a public health expert, uh, formerly of Global Malaria Program, World Health Organization, Geneva, and currently she is a professor emeritus at University of Colombo. She studied medicine at the uh, University of Ceylon in 70, 1972, uh, then moved to the University of London for a PhD in 1980. Uh, she returned, returned to her alma mater in 1989 and now split into University of Colombo for her MD in microbiology. Professor Mendes has uh, made several original scientific contributions to malaria research and public health. She, uh, in 1988, she established the Malaria Research Unit within the Department of Parasitology uh, at University of Colombo. She played a key role in launching the global initiative to roll back malaria in WHO in 1998. While in WHO guided countries in eliminating malaria, she also played an important role in certification of malaria elimination from Sri Lanka. Uh, she was a member of Malaria Policy Advisory Committee of WHO and currently uh, serves on many national and international expert committees, councils, policy forums, and advisory board on malaria, tropical medicine, and research and development. Professor Mendes currently advises international bodies and governments of malaria control and elimination. She has been the recipient of numerous international and national awards. She was awarded the National President Award for Outstanding Citizen 1983 and won 1991 uh, Chalmers Medal for Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. In uh, uh, 1993, Bele K. Ashford Medal from American Society of Tropical Medicine, Medicine and Hygiene. I can read, uh, you know, these, these uh, sort of awards and honors throughout the day, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, without uh, wasting any 
for the time and in interest of time i'm i'm really grateful madam thank you so much for joining us and and i was uh, uh, briefing about madam generally what happened we had a you know very good lecture series this is really a hit series of lectures both infectious disease biology and uh, uh, distinguished lecture series but this is the first time happening with me that i am receiving the you know lots of messages and wishes to dr mendes before his before her talk generally we receive this after the talk so i am i i can see clearly that people are really excited especially we are very excited and we are looking forward for her guidance and supervision in uh, mera india and in general malaria elimination program in india so madam all over the entire thing uh, thank you very much so the floor is yours madam thank you very much dr sharma for that very kind introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, it's a real pleasure to talk to you all at the nimr an institution with which i have had very close connections over many years both personal as well as official personal because um, many of your former uh, directors starting from the late uh, dr v p sharma have been my close friends and official because you are the key institution responsible for malaria research for elimination in india so this is really a great pleasure and i hope i'll be able to say something that would uh, be helpful and relevant to you uh, when your director dr amit sharma uh, invited me uh, to give this talk he suggested that i speak on malaria elimination and uh, also speak on my own career experience i think this is because i spent the first 20 years of my oops um i'm unable to move the slides uh can i i'm unable to okay fine so i think this is because i spent the first 20 years of my career working on malaria research in sri lanka and then uh, i moved to who as dr uh, sharma was uh, men mentioned in his introduction i moved to who to help launch this global malaria initiative uh, roll back malaria and worked there for the next uh, 12 years uh, while there i supported countries and provided technical guidance and advice on eliminating malaria and controlling the disease. And then when I um, retired from WHO, I returned to Sri Lanka and, and I was able to provide advice and support to the malaria elimination effort in Sri Lanka. So my career has spanned the entire spectrum from research to policy and implementation. Now, India is on the path to malaria elimination and you as researchers will play a very important role in achieving that goal. So I thought that the experience of another country that has already walked that path might be of some relevance and interest to you, and hence the title of my talk. Now, let me start with a little background. Uh, as you all know, this part of the world, Southeast Asia, has had a long and harrowing experience with malaria over centuries. This is a map that shows the current burden of malaria in this region, in Southeast Asia, as WHO classifies the region. But uh, it is very low today compared to what it was just a few decades ago. And uh, you might, uh, you might uh, be able, I, I don't know whether some of you are aware, but just a few decades ago, the malaria burden in this part of, this part of the world was very, very high. And the experience of Sri Lanka with malaria aptly, I think, represents this uh, his historical experience. Uh, in Sri Lanka, this is the incidence of malaria in the, uh, in the past 100 years. Uh, and in 1934-35, there was a major epidemic which caused 1.5 million cases and over 80,000 deaths in a population of just 5 million people. You can imagine the scale of the problem. And this was before the time of DDT and chloroquine. So there's very little that could be done. And then came the Global Malaria Eradication Program launched by the World Health Organization. And 
like India did and many other countries did, Sri Lanka also participated in that elimination drive, eradication drive. And very interestingly, in 1963, it was exactly 50 years before the current elimination success. Sri Lanka nearly eliminated malaria. Apparently, there were only 17 cases that year of malaria, and most of them were imported. But due to complacency and failure to sustain a rigorous uh, surveillance and response program, malaria returned with a vengeance. And for the next 40 years, devastated the country with repeated epidemics. And at this time, basically the world had given up on malaria after the global malaria eradication program stopped and it was perceived by many to have failed. And the countries were riddled with drug resistance, insecticide resistance, and there was enormous amount of suffering in the malaria endemic world. Now, let me take you to this part uh, of a period of time, the 1980s and 90s, when I myself experienced the malaria situation when I was in Sri Lanka. And uh, please bear with me if I now talk a little bit about the research that I was engaged in. I, and I'm doing this only because I want to address the relevance of research for malaria control and elimination using the, my own experience in research. So please bear with me. Uh, so in 1974, which was uh, just a couple of years after I graduated from medical school, uh, and two years of clinical practice, I think I got fed up uh, a little bored with clinical medicine and I wanted to join um, uh, the, um, uh, an academic career, so I joined the medical school. And soon after that, I was uh, sent to the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene to do a PhD. There, I did some pioneering work on transmission blocking vaccines in malaria, which is one of the three types of vaccines which are currently under development. And in 1980, I finished my PhD and came back home. And um, at the time, there was a lot of malaria, as you can see uh, uh, here from the incidents in red. Most of this was plasmodium vivax. The green line is plasmodium vivax. When I came back, I was obviously uh, keen to continue my work on vaccines, but I had to face a lot of questions. What kind of animal model should I use for vaccine work? Should it be mice? Should it be simian malarias? Because monkey malarias were endemic in Sri Lanka like it is in India. And as I was pondering these questions, I, met, I happened to meet with Dr. Louis Miller, who was at the time the head of malaria section in the National Institutes of Health in, in the United States. And he told me uh, that I should start working on plasmodium vivax. Now I was taken aback at this and I thought, how on earth am I going to work on vivax? I mean, this parasite cannot even be kept in culture uh, at the time, even now it's a challenge. How am I going to transmit this parasite in the laboratory and so on? But that is the time at which I met with two great scientists. One was the late Dr. Richard Carter, who's, uh, who was in the University of Edinburgh. He passed away, sadly, a few months ago. And the other was Dr. Peter David of the Institute Pasteur in Paris. Uh, they were not only great scientists, but they were really very generous, good people. Uh, with them, the three of us started a program of work on human plasmodium vivax in Sri Lanka. And this period spanned about 20 years, during which um, we did quite a bit of work on human vivax malaria. We raised uh, monoclonal and the first ever panel of monoclonal antibodies against vivax uh, malaria. We identified target antigens of immunity. We worked on pathogenesis, showing that fever and paroxysms of uh, Plasmodium vivax in humans was really associated with the rise in TNF. We studied clinical disease, antiparasite, natural immunity, and, and transmission blocking immunity, and, and many things. Now, at this time, PhD students started uh, entering, uh, coming into the program and registering for their postgraduate degrees. Many of them uh, were academics from the universities in Sri Lanka, but some of them were regional malaria officers. Now, these are the equivalent of what in India are district malaria officers. 
and we call them RMOs. Now, they came to me and asked if they could uh, register for their PhDs in this uh, research program. And I, I felt really privileged because here were young people working at the cutting edge, at the front line of malaria control in the districts, wanting to do some postgraduate research on malaria. I was absolutely, uh, I felt very privileged. They joined the program and I worked with them, not on laboratory oriented uh, research problems, but very much on malaria epidemiology. We showed that malaria infections are clustered. We worked on epidemiological risk, risk factors. We showed how drug resistance had implications, major implications for transmission and defined, we defined the reservoir of infection and so on. Now, in this range of research, from fundamental research to applied research to operational or implementation research, I think that most of this work fell within the realm of applied research, which is meant to answer specific research, aimed to answer specific questions, aimed at solving practical problems. But some of it was driven, obviously, by curiosity and a desire to expand knowledge. So some of it, like the work on pathogenesis, might have edged on, on fundamental research, or they, they were probably more applied. Now, at this time, uh, if you remember the previous slide, this was in the 1980s, there were uh, malaria epidemics were raging in the country. And you might ask me what, how this work, the findings of this research, uh, affected uh, malaria control in the country. Now, the answer is very disappointing it is that it had very li little, if any, effect on malaria control at the time. Uh, certainly not on the act of controlling malaria. And this, I think, was for two reasons. One is, uh, although these findings of, of all this research work had uh, several implications on the development of new strategies and tools like vaccines and, and therapeutics and so on, they really had very little implications for the immediate act of controlling malaria. However, some of the work, uh, which uh, like this, which really had uh, led to a greater understanding of malaria transmission in the country, and they would have had implications for controlling malaria, for refining the strategies and so on. But at the time, the malaria control program had little interest in what we were doing and they were not interested in what we were saying. Uh, and our colleagues in the control program uh, didn't consider us as collaborators. They didn't think we were helpful. In fact, they probably thought that we were collecting data and doing research to highlight some of their deficiencies. So this was a very sad situation. It was disappointing, actually, that um, the work we were doing, we were surrounded by a lot of malaria, we were doing a lot of work on research and none of it or mo most of it had no impact whatsoever. Now, uh, this is, uh, you know, when you're working in an endemic situation, I think the greatest contribution you can make is uh, on human malaria. It's a, it's a privilege that's denied to most malaria researchers in the world. And it's people like you and at that time us who were able to do this. But uh, towards the late 1980s, I was getting uh, very frustrated at uh, not being able to make any inputs into the uh, ravaging malaria situation in Sri Lanka. Uh, like many, I, mean, I did believe that uh, a better use of routine data could improve malaria control. Not just collecting aggregated macro data, but if one looked at the uh, a more um, refined, uh, finer details of, of routine data that's collected. I was very convinced that we could improve malaria control, but this wasn't happening. Uh, the good thing, however, was that the, the district regional malaria officers who were working with us on PhDs, they, after their PhDs, went back to the districts. And in their work, they looked more carefully at their data, their routinely collected data, and they began actually implementing evidence-based malaria control at the time. That, that was one of the good things that happened. So as I was getting uh, increasingly saddened that research is not having an impact on any of the malaria control activities in the country, 
That was the time in 1998 uh, when Dr. Grohal M. Brundtland was elected as the Director General of WHO. And she decided to make malaria the flagship program of WHO. The reason for this is because uh, when she was campaigning for her election in African countries, uh, and she asked the African heads of state what their health problems were, apparently most of them said that their biggest health problem was malaria. So she decided to make malaria the flagship program of WHO. And I, I got a call from her transition team who was preparing for her uh, taking over as head, uh, asked whether I could come to Geneva to help them launch this major global initiative to control malaria. I was, of course, delighted at the prospects of now moving to the policy side, because I was getting increasingly frustrated of research not having much impact, the desired impact on, on malaria control. And I moved there, and in 1998, we launched the Global Rollback Malaria Initiative uh, with the aim of halving the global malaria burden in five years, and again halving it in the next five years. We thought this was entirely doable because the malaria situation in the world was very bad at the time. This initiative uh, was joined by other UN agencies like UNICEF and World Bank and UNDP and other partners rallied round, and there was a worldwide revival of interest in malaria control. And in 2002, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Malaria and TB was established. Now, this is something you might not know, but the Global Fund was established for the entire purpose of funding the control of the HIV epidemic. And tuberculosis was included because TB was a risk factor for, uh, for, for HIV. Malaria was not even in the horizon in their minds. So we had a very difficult time trying to convince the donors at the time um, that malaria should be at least included in, in a small part of the Global Fund's portfolio. Well, we did succeed, and this made an enormous change to malaria worldwide because there was hugely increased international funding through the Global Fund for malaria control. Research funding by other partners also increased. And then endemic countries stepped up malaria control efforts enormously by 1998. Now, like other countries, Sri Lanka too uh, was very uh, optimistic when Roback Malaria was launched and uh, they revived their malaria control activities. Um, now, um, uh, there, was, there was increased funding for malaria. I, I don't know whether I can try to change okay right uh, so sri lanka went ahead and started intensifying their pathological surveillance for malaria using early diagnosis and prompt treatment they stepped up entomological surveillance and did selective vector control uh, they used mobile malaria clinics and outreach programs to reach communities that were isolated and with all these efforts malaria started coming down uh, from 19, uh, from year 2000 to 2001, there was a 68% reduction in the malaria incidence. And if I now expand this part of the graph, this period from 2001 onwards here, the reduction in malaria continued with enhanced efforts to control malaria. There was a 75% reduction from 2000 uh, to 2001, uh, 2001 to 2002, and this reduction continued uh, throughout with intensified malaria control. Now, the interesting, important thing is that this entire period of uh, very successful malaria control happened uh, during the course of a civil war in many parts of the country shown here in green, in the north and east. These were highly malarious areas of the country, and there was a brutal war going on at the time. So this entire malaria control um, uh, period successfully was happened during the, a brutal civil war, which means that uh, anything is possible if you're determined to do it. Now, uh, I think it, it would be good to reflect on what were the key elements in 
effectively controlling malaria up to this stage. I think it was actually high intervention coverage. It was equi providing equitable access to early diagnosis and effective treatment. And by this, I mean uh, access not only to the people who are living in and around the health centers or in towns, but providing access to early and effective diagnosis and treatment to everyone. This includes people living in remote rural areas and anyone. I firmly believe that it's not possible to control and eliminate malaria if we overlook uh, any population subgroup, be they ethnic minorities, be they forest dwellers, be they refugees, be they uh, war affected areas. I, and if, if we ignore any of these and, and have an inequitable uh, intervention coverage, we're not going to be successful. I think this was very important. And secondly, it was integrated vector control based on entomological surveillance data. So it was not blanket coverage with any of the methods, IRS or bed nets or whatever, but it was very careful studies on entomological surveillance and looking at the data and then implementing malaria control. And I think the most important thing is that it was targeted intervention coverage based on locally generated evidence. And I'm going to come back again and again to this point because malaria is a local and focal disease. And uh, at this stage, uh, it was the global fund monies were available to adequately buy drugs and diagnostics, insecticides and so on. And using locally generated evidence, the interventions were targeted to where they should be given. Now, how was all this made possible? I think it was because of some supportive functional and structural arrangements that were there. The responsibility for implementing uh, malaria control was entirely with the regional malaria officers at the district level. But the anti-malaria campaign was responsible for policy, strategy, technical guidance and monitoring and evaluation. Now, the regional malaria officers are, as I said before, what you in India, uh, whom you in India would call the district malaria officers. And the anti-malaria campaign would be the central NBBDCP. So the RMOs, regional malaria officers, were, uh, were actually uh, recruited by the provincial governments. In your case, it would be the state governments. And, um, but they took technical guidance and reported to the anti-malaria campaign. Now, I'm trying to make the comparison with India here very much. Uh, and I will continue to do this for a reason. Uh, Sri Lanka had 24 districts and each of the, the districts are demarcated by these black lines here. And 22 of them were endemic for malaria and each of these 22 districts had a regional malaria officer in them. Now, geographically, and now I'm sure you're thinking uh, Sri Lanka is a very small country, it's an island, so implementation uh, is easy and uh, elimination can be achieved, uh, unlike India, which is a large country. But let's make some comparisons. Sri Lanka would fit, I would say, geographically and area-wise, to maybe a small state in India. And, in, and every state has districts, of course, in India, like this. Now, each regional malaria officer in Sri Lanka had to deal with a geographical area of about 3,000 square kilometers and an average population of 670,000. Some uh, these different colors of the different districts show the population density. Some of them had over a million um, population. Some had uh, less than a, a million. In India, the districts, um, some of the very small districts would have less than a million population, but the larger ones have more than 3 million population. So the range is very wide, but the system is overall very comparable. Now, the reason I say all this and try to make the comparison is because I believe that for mal implementation of good malaria control and elimination, the most Critic, it is critically dependent on the person who's responsible and the team at the district level or below. And this I cannot emphasize more. Now in Sri Lanka, 
The regional malaria officers were highly experienced and dedicated people. Many of them had PhDs in malaria epidemiology and each RMO had a complete team uh, to implement malaria control, including uh, entomology team and uh, other field officers uh, for diagnosis and so on. Now, the knowledge of these are regional malaria officers of the geography of the area, the populations, the mobi mobility of the populations, the uh, vector breeding sites and so on, I think were very important in this successful uh, malaria control effort up to this point. In addition, the anti-malaria ca campaign brought all the regional malaria officers to the headquarters every month for two days. And there, they reviewed the data and monitored implementation very carefully. So this was how, how it was achieved in Sri Lanka. Now, if I uh, then, as the malaria incidence was coming down, even as late as 2007, Sri Lanka had not embarked on an elimination program. It was still malaria control. Now, if I expand this part of uh, the curve, it was only in 2008 that the country embarked on a pre-elimination phase. And this was with the aim of eliminating malaria by uh, falciparum malaria by 2012 and vivax malaria by 2014. And then uh, the elimination phase began in uh, 2011. So uh, during uh, when they embarked on the pre-elimination phase, the strategies changed. Sri Lanka began case-based surveillance using this one, two, three strategy. Now, by this I mean that every case that was diagnosed had to be notified within 24 hours, had to be investigated in great detail within 48 hours, and a response to that case had to be mounted within 72 hours. And this was called the one, two, three strategy. Now, this is what the WHO recommends as the one, three, seven strategy for elimination, which is what China used. Sri Lanka even fast forwarded it and used the one, two, three strategy. Now, the purpose of doing all this was first to ensure that they found out exactly how that person got infected when they found the case how, where, under what circumstances that person got infected. And secondly, to ensure that that person's infection was not transmitted to another one. So, uh, in, the, in 2008, they started classifying cases as uh, uh, imported and indigenous. And as you see here, the orange and yellow colors represent indigenous cases and the green ones represent uh, the proportion of imported cases. As time went by, the number of imported cases uh, proportion increased tremendously, and the dark colors are falciparum, and the light colors are vivax. Now, uh, as the malaria incidents continued to come down, um, they didn't depend on passive case detection anymore. They didn't depend just on people coming with illness reporting for treatment. They did uh, proactive and reactive case detection, meaning proactively they went around uh, and uh, blood filmed all high-risk groups, be they refugees uh, from other countries, be they fishermen coming from, India, from Africa, uh, whether it be um, uh, military people returning from UN peacekeeping missions from Africa or even pilgrims from India. They screened such groups uh, for malaria, and they did reactive case detection, meaning when the, a case was detected, they, uh, they screened uh, people living in a perimeter of one kilometer around the house where they were resident. They traced the contacts of the person and screened everyone who either traveled with them or had the same exposure, would have had the same exposure to them for malaria. And so they intensified uh, case-based surveillance. And uh, every malaria, uh, regional malaria officer in their districts had at least two sentinel entomological surveillance sites. And they also did reactive vector control. When a case was detected, they would uh, examine the area and do uh, vector surveillance and, and control as necessary. Now, as time went by, the use of insecticides requirements went down dramatically as cases went down. And this is one of the greatest benefits of eliminating malaria, other than of the obvious ones, 
you know, you use less and less insecticides um, when, when the case load comes down. Now, um, in, uh, in 2011, there were only 123 cases of malaria, and the last case of malaria was detected in 2012. Uh, that year, there were 23 cases of malaria. And since 2012, the country has been kept free of indigenous malaria till now. Uh, in 2016, the World Health Organization certified the country as being malaria free. Now, uh, I would like to spend a minute reflecting on what the key elements of this elimination success was. It's not the strategies. Now, the strategies are, are no secret. They are recommended standards, recommended strategies, recommended by the World Health Organization, and we all know what they are. I think the key to the success of uh, elimination is uh, a few things. First, the human resource capacity. It was, I believe, the leadership of the Central Anti-Malaria Campaign and the commitment and expertise of the regional malaria officers that was in great part responsible uh, for this success. They did things in, in the most determined and um, highly uh, uh, effective manner. It was almost with military precision, and they were so committed. Even during the war time, the regional malaria officers never left their stations. They continued to do so. The central government sent all commodities and supplies to the war-torn areas. They even controlled malaria in the in the rebel armies. Uh, so no, no party was excluded, and that's the way to do it. The other thing, I think, is the rigorous implementation of plasmodium vivax control by good vector control and radical cure. Now, everyone knows that vivax is more difficult to control and eliminate than plasmodium falciparum for many reasons. And that's why Sri Lanka also set their targets of eliminating vivax two years after falciparum, but they managed to eliminate both at the same time. Uh, but I have a story to tell you here. Uh, you might have noticed that there was this little blip, uh, a rise in, in the malaria incidence as malaria was coming down in the last stages of uh, the elimination effort. And this increase was entirely, almost entirely, due to an increase in plasmodium vivax. And the red dotted line shows the uh, number of vivax cases. And this outbreak was due to uh, plasmodium vivax malaria um, coming up in army camps in the jungle. Now, this was towards the very end of the period of war. And there were, um, this was the place where this epidemic uh, outbreak occurred. Here's a large river flowing through the jungle, and behind these trees were located these army camps in which many of the soldiers were coming down with vivax malaria. And uh, the regional malaria officer at the time, um, who was, I will show a photograph of her in a minute, uh, she rapidly moved in, investigated the outbreak, found that it was due to a um, vast increase in the breeding of Anopheles culicifaces along this river, which had pooled due to a drought. Uh, this is her, uh, Ms. Lalantika Piris. Uh, she passed away two years ago, very sadly. An incredible lady. She here she is uh, talking uh, in the middle of the jungle, talking to the army officers, uh, who uh, uh, army army uh, soldiers and officers who were occupying those camps in which the outbreak occurred, and she uh, got their cooperation, and in fact, uh, larvicided thirty four kilometers of this river together with the army. This was an incredible feat because she realized that no matter how much diagnosis and treatment she, she was, they were doing, the outbreak did not come, uh, was not being controlled. So she decided and, and implemented a larviciding program along 34 kilometers of the river. And another important thing happened. Uh, normally, the soldiers would uh, be treated for three days with chloroquine. This was plasmodium vivax, of course and they would be sent home on home leave, and they would go to different parts of the country where their homes were. And they would, and they were given primaquine to take for 40 days. But at this point in time, they convinced the army to make a change in policy. 
they asked them to keep these soldiers in the barracks for 14 days without sending them home after treatment and uh, gave them primaquine uh, as directly observed treatments. This, I think, was an, a very important policy change. And if this outbreak had not been controlled swiftly and effectively, I really think that Sri Lanka could not have eliminated malaria because these soldiers would have taken malaria to various parts of the country and it would have caused a resurgence just like what happened 50 years ago when Sri Lanka nearly eliminated but failed to achieve the goal. And this is also the story of South Korea. This happened in South Korea, but that's another story and I don't think we have time for me to relate that story. So the importance of rapid action, even at the very end stages of elimination, is illustrated by this story. The other key element of the elimination success was, I think, very effective surveillance and response, the one, two, three strategy, which was implemented with great precision and commitment. Monitoring and evaluation was extremely important in this program. And I think the most important thing was throughout the country, they were thinking and acting locally and focally. And it was no matter how good uh, the central program is, it can't be done unless you have committed people and a good program implemented locally and focally. Now, um, I want to remind you at this stage that malaria elimination is really not the end game. The end game for all of us in these countries is sustaining zero malaria after elimination and certification because the risk of malaria resurging in any of our countries in the region is extremely high. It will be until the entire region is free of malaria because there is an abundance of malaria vectors in the country, so very high receptivity, and there is massive population movement. The number of imported malaria cases in the country every year uh, is, poses an enormous risk for malaria to come back. Now, um, I want to spend a few minutes at the end of this talk on uh, the role of research in sharing my own thoughts on the role of research in malaria elimination. Now, I think it's something we all know, and it uh, goes without saying, that research at every level, whether it's fundamental research, applied research, or operational research is, they are all highly relevant and necessary for malaria elimination. But I'd like to focus uh, on the end stages in the elimination phase and where operational research becomes very necessary and important to improve surveillance and response uh, to the need to analyze epidemiological and operational data to provide feedback on the strategies and to, you know, Towards, when malaria situation improves and incidence comes down, things change very rapidly on the ground. The risk, uh, the people who are at risk today uh, will change. The people who bring in malaria to the state that is eliminating malaria today may be one group. In a week's time, it will be a completely different group. So the situation changes very rapidly and it's very important to, to monitor and evaluate and to conduct research to revise and reform strategies at this stage. Now, I want to illustrate this uh, by showing that in Sri Lanka during the elimination drive, there was um, a lot, great deal of operational and applied research conducted to support the program. The, the malaria control program had a very good network of researchers working very closely with them. And um, they did a great deal of work. I'm, I'm just going to put up some of the uh, publications that arose uh, so, that, uh, to so as to convey the areas in which this operational research was conducted. So effectiveness of the case detection strategies, characterizing imported malaria, the use of uh, private partnerships, public partnerships, the role of the private sector, uh, the need for preventive and curative services in the military, because the military is, uh, were the people in whom most malaria infections were uh, clustered towards the end. Um, the, uh, the role of uh, supporting groups, the use of diagnostics, um, the response of imported malaria to, uh, to the anti-malaria medicines and therapeutic efficacy, 
the success of chemoprophylaxis uh, when people travel outside. Uh, they reported a new vector that was introduced to Sri Lanka, a very important vector, an awfully Stephen Um, and so on and so forth. But uh, let me just take uh, one of these studies to illustrate how, uh, why I say uh, these are important for refining strategies. Now, here's a study in which they looked at uh, the blood smears that were being examined every year. About a million blood smears were being examined by the anti malaria campaign every year. And here are the, they looked at the proportions uh, of blood smears taken from different strategies. So in blue were the passive case detection uh, blood smears. In uh, brown here were the ones that were taken from routine uh, proactive screening of high risk groups. So they, when they went out and screened people living in endemic areas and so on. And in green was the proportion of blood smears they took from reactive case detection. That is when a case is detected, when they, when they explored who their contacts were and screened them and so on. But now look at the positives. Most of the positives, in fact, 95% of the positives came from passive case detection. Although so many blood films were taken from the um, proactive screening of uh, risk groups, very, very small numbers of them were actually positive only this year, nothing in the next two years. And even though there were very few blood smears taken uh, from reactive screening when a case was found, they yielded quite a large number of positives. So this uh, made the anti-malaria campaign change their strategy of surveillance they uh, defocused their attention on routine screening of in endemic areas, and they enhanced the screening of uh, people by passive by passive case detection and uh, reactive case detection. Now you might think that passive case detection is is a no brainer. It's it's an easy one. People come for treatment, but you know, uh, towards when when the malaria incidence comes down towards the end of elimination, one of the biggest challenges that a country faces is that doctors forget about malaria. They don't test people with fever for malaria. And as a result, there are long delays in the diagnosis of malaria. Now, this is an enormous threat, uh, which could uh, bring malaria back because there are people going around being investigated for dengue and various other illnesses, having malaria and transmitting the disease. So the Malaria Control Program in Sri Lanka had to step up its, all its efforts to try and remind doctors that they should uh, st uh, start screening for malaria again, and, and so on. So this is just an illustration of uh, what this was. Now, with great humility, uh, I, I have to say that I was able to instill uh, something very important in the program in Sri Lanka, and that is that researchers worked with the control program staff, helping them to design studies to tackle specific challenges that the control program was facing. The control program staff, while working on these research problems, enrolled in postgraduate research training programs, and they were supervised by the researchers. And it was the first authors, and most of the papers that I showed you were people from the control program. And I think this is, this is very important. This is something I only understood after I moved away from my research program in Sri Lanka and went on to the policy side. Uh, I began to see myself in the mistakes I made uh, when I was a researcher. The control program staff are burdened with, uh, uh, with bureaucracy, a heavy burden of work. They lack good supervision. They lack opportunities to engage in research. They can't even begin to analyze their own data that they collect because they don't have the skills and expertise and they don't have much uh, help, technical help to do this. So naturally, they see researchers as unhelpful and as opportunists who are only interested in publishing their work. Uh, that's why I think that researchers need to work with the program to understand this is the only way that we will understand the most relevant research needs. When I look back at the time I worked uh, in Sri Lanka on, on this research program, I was working, I mean, I, I thought out the research problems on my own. I really didn't have much connection with the program. And then when I did all this research and 
I was disappointed that they didn't take, take up the results that I was showing them. And I think that was very wrong. Now I understand, after I moved to the other side of the line, I understood the need to work with the program and that it's only then that we begin to understand the most relevant research needs and the need to help the program and that's the only way we can build trust. Now, uh, NIMR uh, and ICMR have uh, research stations in almost uh, every state of India, I believe. And NVD NVBDCP has uh, has uh, have their branches in every state also. Uh, I don't know if it's called NVBDCP anymore after the integration, but you know what I mean. Now I'm sure that uh, there is a lot of connections between the NIMR star research stations and the NVBDCP in the in the in the states, and I hope there is because that's the only way I think we can make a meaningful contribution to elimination through operational research. Now. As I said before, every level of research, whether it's fundamental or applied operational, they're all uh, very important in, in making a contribution to elimination at various levels. But if you really want to make uh, an impact on the ground uh, to achieve elimination in the short, in, in the immediate term, I think it's definitely the operational research needs that come right on top. And, uh, and that can only be done if we work together with the control program staff. Um, it is um, the quote that only by giving are you able to receive more than you already have. I think this applies to, to researchers as well. Now, I, I want to end by saying that um, I have had the privilege myself of seeing and working on malaria in a country that at a time when it was ravaged by malaria epidemics and also of living to see the disease being eliminated from the country and being a part of that effort. It's something that I would not have asked, I could not have asked for even in my wildest dreams. And I hope all of you have that privilege too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mendes, to taking us uh, through your uh, entire career trajectory and journey from, a, you know, from a clinician to researchers to the uh, key person in elimination in malaria in Sri Lanka. So uh, I have uh, I have received a few questions. With your permission, if you if you allow, uh, can we ask a few questions? Yes, certainly. I'll be pleased to. Okay, so I have uh, received. Uh, is uh, Dr. Manjurahi there? Good morning, Sachin. Sachin, I think Dr. Amit wants to ask first. Let him go ahead, and Dr. Dingra also has raised raised his hand. So I think okay. let the the research side and the program side ask the question first. I'll be very okay. happy to ask later. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Amit Sharma, first, please. Dr. Mendes, thank you so much for this uh, absolutely wonderful uh, talk and this uh, great uh, journey that you've taken. And, and again, many congratulations to Sri Lanka and, and also to you personally, because it's obviously a great sense of achievement. I think there are many issues that uh, perhaps in terms of questions that uh, many in the audience might have, which mirror my thoughts. But one very brief question that I have is that um, there is the traditional disconnect between research and program, as you yourself mentioned, uh, even from the early part of your career when you were doing more basic research. And later on, you were able to coalesce the two in a manner uh, of speaking. Why has there been a disconnect in, in that? Or why are there two centers of, let's say, scientific um, gravity in terms of research and program? Why are there separate entities traditionally? Thank you. Mm, thank you. Now that's huh, that's a challenging question. So you are asking why are why are they separate from the beginning, right? That's your question. I mean, why do we have a research arm and a and a control arm separately? So I suppose what you're saying it's a challenging question. What you're saying is 
why shouldn't research be embedded in the program, right? I mean, yes. yeah, I think, yes. why not? But yes. you know, the, the thing is, uh, who wanted to ask the question? Is that Dr. Shah? It, that who was the question? That was, uh, sorry, that was me, uh, Amit. Oh, Amit, oh, that's uh, Dr. Amit Sharma, thank you. So, I, I think it's, I mean, I think the justification for separating the two, uh, Dr. Sharma, is that, you know, by definition, they're, they're, they're two very different things. The program's prime uh, focus has to be implementation. And the researchers is a very, very different mindset. Um, and it attracts different kinds of people and, and, and it requires uh, different kinds of uh, uh, facilities, structures, and so on. Uh, and traditional research was done in, in an academic and research environment, not in programs. But uh, I think when it comes to applied and fundamental research, there's no question that you have to be separated. But I think what you're saying is, why isn't operational research embedded in a program, right? Yeah, why not? Well, you know, you know, I used to always think when I worked in the Faculty of Medicine, um, uh, the, uh, I was a teacher at the medical school and my prime responsibility was not research. In fact, I had to do research on stolen time. Prime responsibility was teaching. And I used to uh, look at my colleagues in research programs like yourselves in NIMR and think how very privileged you are. You can spend the entire day working on research. Whereas I had to work on weekends and after four o'clock in the evenings, uh, almost secretly on my research program. So control programs are very busy. They, they, just, they just can't devote enough time. I think that's the reason. But I, I think the, the important takeaway from your question, Dr. Sharma, is that uh, operational research should be embedded in programs. And you know, and I think you know who can do that? It's we who can do that. It's researchers who can do that. And that's why I kept saying, you know, some part of the NIMR structure, the people who are working on field aspects have yeah. to liaise with, with N N N N NVBDC. They yeah. have to work more closely. Yes. Um, don't make the mistakes I made when I was younger. I mean, I was in my own cell. I thought I could do it. But no, later, I mean, I now I, now I work with the program. I, I ensure that researchers are only supporting that program. They don't, you know, concoct their own research priorities in their minds. Yeah. I think it's an important uh, question, which I didn't answer very well, but I think it raises it, it, it stimulates us to think. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I'll, um, it's indeed something that uh, perhaps needs a larger discussion, but, uh, but uh, yes, I think we have, um, there is a door for, for uh, further discussion on, on, on this. Perhaps. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so and much. I think, yes. I think <laughs> your, your predecessors, even your late father, Dr. V.P. Sharma and I used to talk a lot about this, because he did a lot, enormous amount of work on the ground, you know, on, on controlling malaria. But there was this continuous divide yeah. of, and lack of uptake. And this is something, I think it's improved now. And I think you can do a lot more. Yes, improve. yes. I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. Over to Sachin, yes. Dr. Rahi, your turn, please. Uh, thank you, ma'am. It's a wonderful and very, very nice lecture. And I can't, I mean, uh, stop talking about it. But, uh, and you have touched a lot of raw nerves and a lot of similarities are there in the in the system. And I I was reading the slides and I was echoing it in my heart. Oh, gosh, we face the same things. When you say from the research side, researchers are seen as opportunist. And there is a little bit of mistrust between the researcher and the program people because they are the people on the ground working for malaria elimination as well whereas a researcher even with the good intentions they are seen as somebody just want to have data publish for their own glory that's how basically we are seen in our spaces but actually it's not like this we really would want to work towards the betterment of the program of the public health Achieving, I always tell Dr. Sharma, the end point of all the research is actually achieving zero malaria case, right? 
and so we are working towards that direction now the pathways can be different but the end goal is the same ma'am one very heart touching slide which you showed earlier was um, where all your earlier work of basic research we are talking about immune mechanisms you are about you know a search for a good vaccine or vivax culture and you thought that this has very little impact and you wanted to shift towards policy and towards the actual operational and public health research i am i am a medic with the public health background and i am not from the microbiology background so maybe i am tilted towards that already i already look forward that all the tools currently available are quite effective and i think sri lanka even before the ll line came in which is the most powerful tool at the moment sri lanka could do the zero case magic and even before the most effective control tools so i think at the moment we have very effective tools for elimination from good strategies to surveillance to all your research pointing out that passive case detection if done well will do wonders there is no need to put in resources for reactive active case so all these lessons are from the country like yours like many other countries which we can filter and implement in india as well despite its size and problem size my point is after you have shifted your thought process from uh, how much basic science or how much fundamental science research is needed at this point of time to achieve the goal of elimination and how much more resources should be put in into base into public health research and operational research so ma'am uh, what is the lesson for india should be more focusing on public health operational which you already pointing out but looking at the vaccine now who recommending that vaccine now even that vaccine has come out of years of research on a good candidate and all i mean we can't totally blank out basic and fundamental research but definitely more more uh, uh, you know impetus and more even funding more uh, attention is needed for operational research my second advice i would want to seek from you how to break that barrier of between research and the program and that's quite palpable in india as well in as any other country my very senior uh, senior mentors and people from program are attending this talk so there is definitely a barrier we are seen as opportunistic looking for data looking for papers that's all but we would want to be very useful partners to the program thank, thank you. you dr manju my goodness you you raised some very very important uh, issues um, i think the most uh, one of the most important things you said was uh, something i should have said myself but thank you for for saying it is that um with the tools we have today we can eliminate malaria in india if let's let's focus on a country in india yes i i believe we can do it so that being the basic premise i think um the reason why we are not achieving it is because of lapses in operations that's to me i i will argue this out with anyone it is entirely to do with uh, with implementation now having said that um there is no doubt that better tools are needed uh, it would make it easier if we had better tools if we had a one shot vaccine which we could give all those people in the very remote areas uh, who are not accessible it would make elimination possible tomorrow so there is so both so there is no question we need better tools but as you said dr manju we don't we don't need to wait for it we can do it now with existing tools so so i think i mean this is a bland statement but i think we need both we absolutely need to uh, apply the fundamental research because we don't know what the challenge will be tomorrow now, sri lanka can easily get malaria back tomorrow you know it's so vulnerable there's so much receptivity here and for that i mean still we can do it with current tools but we might need it we we will need better tools we will need a better than 14 days of primaquine to uh, to uh, prevent relapses in vivax if we had that solution it would be better but we still can do it now if chai i mean forget sri lanka china did it Forget Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is a small country. Anyone could still say, and it's it's an island. China did it. China did it with existing tools, with um, an incredible um, uh, set of operational rules and guidelines, and thinking decentralized, locally, locally. I mean, at the district level. So I think this is this is really my my 
my message to anyone, any country who, who wants to eliminate malaria, don't wait for new tools. You don't, uh, you read said it rightly, you can do it now. If China can do it, anyone can, I mean, it's easier said than done, anyone can do it. Uh, but uh, please let us not forget applied and fundamental research because, you know, like we had with the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic, we know that, you know, uh, vaccination came to the, uh, rose to the challenge and, you know, things improved. I don't know with hindsight what we will say, but, uh, but uh, we, need, we, we definitely need better tools because organisms evolve. And, uh, but today it's operational research. It's really operational support. And, and you, we need to work with the program and support them. I think this is something, I mean, this is something I would never exchange. I mean, you know, from when, I, when I moved from research to the policy side, it was very tough. You move from, a, uh, from doing things you really like to do, which researchers always do, you know, curiosity and so on, move to an area you don't know anything about. Nobody knows you in that field. Uh, if you're a researcher, they look down on you. So I, I really suffered for many years on the policy, but I wouldn't, if I had an, another chance to live, I wouldn't do it differently because I learned so much. It's only when you cross over to the other side, you see the true picture. You know, as researchers, we don't see it. The pro we program needs help, and they need genuine help. It's, uh, and, and as, I mean, you have to build that trust. They, and, and it's so rewarding. I mean, it's so rewarding when you see researchers, uh, when you do operational research, it's not you that matter. It's, it's the, the thing you're helping. It's the help you're giving. And the reward is enormous, actually. You know, you see things improving on the ground. You see people in the control program more um, interested, more focused, more committed. They are excited. It's it's an incredible experience, I tell you. So my message again and again is the operational researchers must support the program and uh, not uh, not imagine things on their on their own. And as I I, I did, I admit I. I did, I made many mistakes and I only realized it very much later in life. Over. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, your energy and enthusiasm is very, very infectious. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Thank you, you were so kind. So, so uh, moving toward this discussion, what uh, is going on, it, it is worth to have uh, some points or questions from Dr. Neeraj Hinda is here with us, is a former uh, director and you rightly pointed out, madam, it is still NBBDCP. Dr. Dhingra, your turn, please. You may ask questions. Oh, uh, first, uh, let me say that always listening to Professor Kamni Mendes, you know, her humbleness, it's so heartening to hear her. I think the last few words which you have said, it shows the passion that drives you for malaria elimination. I think you said in your slides also, you need very dedicated people at the district level and the state level, or even at the national level to go on with the research. Definitely that's a, uh, with the program, that's definitely a requirement. I personally feel when we differentiate ourselves into researchers and policymakers or implementationists, then we lose sight of our objectives. I think what you said is absolutely correct. That means the implementation science research and uh, or just satisfying or looking for answers to reach out to the last or the most remote corner for treatment, diagnosis, and reaching out to those ideas. That may be, that is very important. Now, my question, it's not a question. I know no one can ask you a question. It's more like a guidance from you. The thing is that now with the newer things coming up, like for example, the drug resistance, the insecticide resistance, the diagnostic issue, PFHR, P2, deletion issues, and others which are coming up, and definitely the researchers are going towards that side. 
the shift to those who are going to much molecular genomic structures and other studies. And I think the loss, which is for operational or so-called implementation research, especially in Indian case, which is required now, as you yourself said, is very important. I don't know what your views would be on this aspects. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dingra. It was a real privilege to have you listening on this, and thank you. Thank you for, uh, for, for your question. Um, so if I understood you right, uh, the new challenges of diagnosis and drug resistance and so on are um, attracting researchers more to those uh, than uh, to operational research to support programs. So I think, is that, is that, did I get the question, uh, the comment right, Dr. Dingra? Uh, what you're saying is, you know, when new problems come up, ob obviously researchers are driven towards those. Uh, you're muted, Dr. Dingra. Dr. Dingra, you're muted. Sure, I think the system has unmuted me now. Yes, basically, you know, the shift of researchers towards the basic or up to basic sciences, which is more lucrative, more money, more research, or maybe more publications than what we are talking, which is more difficult, the implementation science, or which may be more difficult, less of money, and maybe less of publication. Would researchers shift gears, especially at this time when India needs the applied or implementation research the maximum. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. You got it correctly. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Uh, so I yeah, I think that's a natural phenomenon, unfortunately. I mean I I think that I mean for a researcher, I think it's it's the balance. It's the balance between um between satisfying your curiosity and being in a good environment versus the satisfaction you get of actually seeing impact on the ground so this is this is where the issue is now i think some researchers by nature they will be driven more towards the upstream research and that's fine i think that's very much needed i mean we need new tools better tools and so on but i think there will be many who are from the beginning who have been focused on the more um, the the downstream end of research and this is where I think, Dr. Dingra, we need to partner with them for the operational work. And this is so important. I, I, I mean, this requires some leadership on the part of both control program and the researchers. I think we need to bring them together and ask the researchers to give more than they take. Uh, and, and the results, I'm, I'm telling you, the results are uh, very, very rewarding when you do that. I have experienced it myself. I, you know, as you said, Dr. Dinger, there, is, there are no answers to this. We all know this, but at least if we are aware of this, and if we say eliminating malaria from uh, India is the supreme goal, and we need to support that, then I think I think many of us will, you know. Uh, drop our lab work and and try to analyze data and, and at least encourage that. Yeah, this is I think this is very much needed. Thank you, Dr. Dinga. Thank you, Madam. If if time allows, uh, can I, you know, uh, ask a few more questions or otherwise I yes. can continue. Yes, I mean yes, I'm I'm fine at this end if if you have no time constraints there okay uh, so we have uh, uh, another colleague of dr neeraj hingra dr abdesh kumar here mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. dr abdesh kumar please ask your question yeah thank you very much dr sachin and it was a very nice pleasure to listen to dr kamini uh, uh, so thanks, Dr. Kamini, for this an excellent and very informative talk. I'll not go into the discussion of researcher versus the program manager. So I am debating a little bit. 
uh, but your talk has given us a lot of guidance and a lot of insights into it. So thanks for that. I'm coming to the strategies versus the implementation of strategies. And as you said, the strategies are there. We have the tools. We can do it. The question is how to implement those strategies. Like we achieved 85% of malaria decline in five years, beginning 2016 up to 2020. So the question is, do we require a verticality in the system actually versus the horizontality? Now, verticality is there in the program up to certain extent, like at the national level, maybe at the state level, but the district and down below where these strategies are to be implemented in an effective manner. So that's the question. Uh, so what is your take or what is your thought on that? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abdesh Kumar. It's a pleasure to see you again. I um, Good question. Um, if I'm very honest, I would say uh, malaria elimination cannot be achieved by uh, through an int entirely integrated approach. Basically, I'm saying you need verticality. Um, now, there is no place in the world, at least in our region of the world, where things uh, programs are vertical anymore. As you know, and I know very well, the program, there, there is a central program, but you have to work at the state level. At the state level and at district level, there is a certain amount of integration with other public health uh, things. I think, I think the way out of this, Abdesh, is that we need to have a focal person who is dedicated to malaria. I don't think we can do it otherwise. It's, I think it's a, it's a pipe dream if, if you think, you know, you can use the public health system, existing system, integrate all the vector borne diseases at the, at the district level. I think not. Elimination of malaria is, is not easy. It's a huge challenge, and I think, uh, I think you need a, a, a person who is dedicated, responsible for malaria. I don't think you can do it otherwise. I would love to hear from anyone who believes otherwise. Um, and that person has to be empowered. That person needs staff, he, uh, at least until integration. Now, let me tell you something, Abdesh. We, uh, in Sri Lanka, they are very nervous that sooner than later, now there's no malaria, there'll be greater integration. And I keep telling them, not yet, because, yes, try it out at the, at the uh, district level in a few pilot areas. But if you do it too soon, it's going, this is going to come back. And I, I know this has happened. You know, Sri Lanka eliminated leprosy uh, several decades ago. And, and they, what the first thing they did was after certification, they disbanded the leprosy campaign and they asked all the clinicians to take over the leprosy work. And you know what happened? It came back. Leprosy is on the rise now in Sri Lanka. And this is an example I like to, like to share with all my malaria colleagues anywhere. Don't integrate too early. So I think it's, it's futile. If, I mean, you're, it's, it's crazy if you think you can do it by, by you can't eliminate malaria by a fully through a fully integrated system. And this is why, uh, Abdesh, I kept talking about that regional malaria officer. And the equivalent would be someone like the district malaria officer in, in, uh, in India. Now, I have met several district malaria officers in India. I don't know, I'm not sure about this, but I think if you um, burden them with filariasis work and other things and a lot of other things, I don't think that person can be held accountable for malaria. You know, that person on the ground needs to be absolutely empowered and given a full team and everything they need. And they need to be... Uh, um, monitored, I and mean, I don't mean in a top-down manner, but they, they need to be encouraged and monitored, yeah. So the short answer is, uh, I don't know what you think, but I, I, I don't think you can eliminate malaria through, uh, without having a person dedicated, and a team dedicated, in, in, the, in the case of India, at the district level or even below.
But after elimination, uh, that's another story. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kamini, for that. Because India's case, especially because the districts are huge. And, and there are other actually issues where we require a dedicated, um, even if there is a dedicated district malaria officer, he or she is given other responsibilities. Maybe he's also looking after the tuberculosis, maybe some other actually programs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what my actually point was that once we move into the elimination mode, after we have covered the control component of the actually malaria program, Although it is very difficult, but we must try and try to have a dedicated person from the district and down below so as to move towards the malaria elimination. So that was my point. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamini. Thanks a lot. Okay, so uh, can we have uh, Dr. Ashwini Kumar, uh, Bhavna? Hi, and uh, Professor Kamini, how are you, ma'am? Okay, I have uh, moved to Vector Control Research Center, Pondicherry. Uh, so I, my question is related to vectors, therefore. You know, my concern is uh, Anopheles Stephens, I now trying to invade Jaffna or already has invaded Jaffna. How big is that going to be a challenge in addition to the receptivity, which is already existing for Anopheles Ulysse phases? And of course, you have Anopheles subpictus B also as a vector. So with the Anopheles Stephens I advancing uh, towards the main island, would that not be a bigger challenge? Or are there any strategies being worked out to stamp it out? from uh, the places of invasion. Uh, I, I, and, and the other thing which I want to uh, say is that always it is really great to listen to you. It's, it's like music to any malariologist in the years, you know, and your vast knowledge and your journey, your experience, uh, your lecture of 40 minutes is like 40 years of journey. So thank you very much for, for this very enlightening talk. So uh, that, uh, and it's such a pleasure seeing you again. Thank you so much. For thank your you, Dr. Ashwani Kumar. It's delightful to see you again. You know, I, I feel like I'm home again when I see all of you. It's been two, two years of not seeing you all. It's been too long. Um, I must have been... Uh, in my last birth, I must have been there, I'm sure. So, um, so yes, the uh, Anopheles Stevenson is a huge uh, new problem that Sri Lanka has. You know, it, 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 came, it was detected only a few years ago. It has multiplied the receptivity by an enormous factor. But, you know, Ashwin, Ashwani, it is, uh, the program is doing a huge amount of work on trying to keep it low. It's now only in four districts of the country from the beginning and it's been kept in for and it's really under control they are they've done a lot of work they're spending an enormous effort on this uh, more, the the biggest the, the most um, the most amount of effort is going into uh, biological control using fish as mm -hmm. as uh, larvicide for lar uh, larvivorous fish um, and i know Sar i know sarala you're there you were there as well I don't, I'm not an entomologist, so please don't uh, take everything I say as, uh, as uh, uh, correct. But um, uh, the, the fish program, the larvivorous fish program has been quite effective, I must say. You know, they have, con they have managed to confine the breeding places to wells. They are still not breeding in tanks. So I think it's an enormous success, but I keep asking the program, Every month we have a little meeting on Stevenson, okay, every month. And the uh, regional malaria officers from these four districts uh, come and present every month, the, all their control strategies, all their results. And I'm very impressed that they're able to keep it at a very, very low. They even tell you the number of wells that are positive, and it's very, very few, I must say. But I keep asking the program, how, I mean, how long are you, are we going to be able to do this? 
I suppose, I don't know, I'm asking all of you, I suppose they'll have to, because this is a huge risk for malaria coming back. There is no other uh, way than implementing control of Stevens Eye, right? I'm yeah, asking. yeah, there are multiple, multiple breeding sites preferred by Stevens Eye, and yeah. in uh, uh, I mean, uh, restricting them to the wells which are mother foci is the right strategy. But Stephen's eye is known to be breeding in the curing waters, the masonry mm -hmm. tanks, the overhead tanks, yeah. even the terraces, clogged terraces, lintels, wherever there is a there is water stagnation, particularly during rains. It then expands, you know, horizontally and then it, uh, <laughs> restricts itself. So uh, in Goa, what we learned was that the best time to contain this vector is, you know, when uh, when it's a dry season or, or least opportunity for it. Uh, as they say in army, you know, the hit the enemy when it is in the bunkers, you know, once it is in the field, it's very difficult to fight the enemy out. So that's the strategy and the, I mean the lean period when it is very much restricted to a few key sites that we should be, you know, focusing control of Stephen's eye. But then I would say that, uh, that Lank Sri Lanka should try to stamp it out systematically. It's very difficult to remove a species, you know, Anopheles gambi is an example from I Brazil, know. as you know, Sopper did, Adam Sopper. But that was so difficult, as you know, it was an army-like uh, situation. Uh, so mm -hmm. same situation, if it is not possible, then Stephen Sai is going to take over one day. It's very hard sure. to chase every bit of breeding place and, you know, so it will be very, very difficult. So a lot of investment is needed in, in really removing Stephen Sai from, from that, you know, uh, northern part of Sri Lanka. Yeah. Now, the origin. thank you. Yeah, the original aim of the campaign was to uh, elim eliminate uh, Stephen Sai. But I'm not sure, as you said, I mean, this is now it's been several years down the line. I, I think it's now they have given in to uh, accepting that this has to be controlled. I mean, they, I, they still have the elimination goal as, as in their minds. I don't know whether it's possible. You know, now, Ashwani, now that you have come closer to Sri Lanka, you should come mm -hmm. over. And actually, we should have, it will be very good to have a meeting at some point with the Sri Lankans also coming and giving you their experience because, you know, it might be a little different. And of course, as you know, Stephen Sai has started invading other countries as well, no? In Africa as well, there's Ethiopia. huge, they're taking Ethiopia. over the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, yes. Ethiopia and Sudan and all those countries. So, exactly. so, so just for your kind information, five of the Sri Lankan officers had come to VCRC in 2019. And yeah. and it also uh, and the group contained uh, I mean group had one uh, central entomologist uh, so she was very keen on uh, you know discussing this issue as you said rightly so I had uh, I had uh, agreed to visit they said could you visit I said yes I could visit there but then you know because of pandemic that, that yes. those things were not possible but I think now the opportunities might open up and yeah, also exactly. why, and also vice versa. I feel that India needs to learn a lot from the elimination campaign that you had, uh, particularly sustenance. Uh, in the, India is getting into elimination now phase. I mean, uh, 2027 is, is when we should be eliminating on paper. I mean, as per the plan. But then, you know, uh, the strategies which Sri Lanka has used, as you have, you know, alluded to, uh, India, Indian program, uh, officials at the district level, state level must learn what what the Sri Lanka has done in order to to sustain uh, this uh, you know elimination uh, so far, and I think a lot of learning there for India from Sri Lankan experience. Thank you very much. I think others might be waiting for their questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashwani. Good luck. Bye. Thank you. Bye. So with this and in interest of time, I'm sure, Madam, you will allow me to write to you lots of questions. I mean, I can ask throughout the day. So uh, uh, we need to uh, conclude the session here, and uh, I will, I will, uh, you know, uh, send you all the questions what I'm received here to email whenever you have time, so uh, you can answer that. But uh, with that, I'm uh, really thankful from the core of my heart. 
from NMR, from ICMR, from uh, Mera India team. We are really grateful and thankful. Despite your very busy schedule, you have given us time. You have taken us through your, not only through the, your, you know, elimination, uh, how you achieved the elimination, but your journey as well is very inspiring. I can see lots of messages here uh, for congratulating us for, for arranging this talk. Thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, I request you and I invite you in advance whenever uh, I hope the situation is better now. Whenever you are in India, please come to visit us at NMR. Uh, we would really love to hear you again in person. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Thank you very much. I have, I thank you for, if, I have seen a lot of very good questions and comments in the chat box. I'd be delighted to respond to them. If you could send them by email, I will uh, uh, yes. send it back. So, that, so it yes. was a real pleasure. It was such a pleasure to connect with all of you. I just wish I could have answered all the questions, but time doesn't allow us to do that. Thanks again, and I wish you all a successful journey, a very successful journey to malaria elimination in India. Really look forward to that day. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you Thank so much. You. Looking forward for your guidance and supervision in our program. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.